welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is The Daily Show, where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is your Collider Movie Talk crew. First up, senior producer John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everyone. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Headquarters here in Burbank, California. And just before the cameras rolled, we had a big breakdance party breakout, cardboard on the floor, Adidas windbreaker outfits for everybody. It was a good time. Also, here is writer director John Schnepp. Yeah, we uh, we had uh, the linoleum out. Camp PS started doing these helicopters. <laughs> we were freaking out. It was insane. And Christian Harlaw. Oh, I will find video of Campia doing it. <laughs> put a side by side with Vin Diesel breakdancing, and we'll do a who did it better. Well, here's here's the funny thing. This is the generation generational gap at this table between you know from here over and then that end of the table <laughs> over know. there, where it's like what's breakdancing? We're talking yeah. about these break da- old breakdancing stories, and today's like where's the video? Where's the video? It's like you see this happened in the late '80s before uh-huh. cell phones had video cameras built into right. them. There before is no, cell phones or cell <laughs> phones. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. And then she's like, wait a minute, you were doing this before I existed. And it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, just shut up. Yeah. <laughs> and your Adidas windbreaker. And my Adidas windbreaker. Out. It's going to make a comeback. <laughs> I can't wait to find this video. I will find it. <laughs> I will. I will. All right. If a story be currently being circulated is to be believed, it looks like the Daywalker could be returning to the big screen. According to a new report in Bleeding Cool, Marvel Entertainment has recently halted development on a new Blade comic book series in order to use the plot for a potential new Blade movie. The plot of the new comic book series was said to revolve around a 16-year-old girl who always knew there was something something different about her, and then discovers she is actually the daughter of the half-vampire Blade. Actor Wesley Snipes recently claimed at Comic-Con that he had met with Marvel at some point to discuss possibilities of his return as Blade, but nothing official ever came out of it. Schnepp, do you believe this report, and if so, what would you think about a new Blade film with this sort of storyline? I like the idea. I mean, I wonder if they're going to try to do like some kind of a Netflix deal and do a Blade you know, TV series. I mean, it seems a little weird to try to bring Wesley Snipes into the Marvel Cinematic Universe after already having done all those blades that weren't part of it. I, but I'm not opposed to it, so I like the idea. I would much, I would love to see, instead of just doing a Blade movie, do like a Midnight Suns and have the werewolf and, you know, Frankenstein, all the monsters, Ghost Rider, all of them in one film. So I think it's a cool idea. I, I don't think I believe the story, but if it is true, I think it's rather interesting because... Look, one of the big things I've always said about that is a hindrance to Blade coming back and being part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Blade don't fit right. into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Maybe you can find a way to make him fit, but that requires a, a reboot of the character that is a, you know, a, a hard PG-13 type of character or whatever, not Wesley Snipes. Although, you know, what does make this interesting is those stories we heard coming out of Comic-Con about Wesley Snipes claiming he had met with Marvel at some point, nothing really came out of it. Something like this, I always said you can't bring Wesley Snaps back as Blade, but a storyline that kind of focuses on a 16-year-old daughter of Blade, all of a sudden now Wesley Snipes goes from, ah, it's too late for him to be Blade again, to Wesley Snipes would be perfect for this. So there's a lot of big questions that still have to be answered. How do you fit a Blade into a, a Marvel Cinematic Universe? Would Marvel then look at this as the first film they do in a long time that doesn't exist within their main cinematic universe and actually exists outside of it in in another sort of universe. I don't know. It raises a lot of questions. I don't think I believe the story, but if it is true, it raises some interesting possibilities. Christian, what do you think? Yeah, I don't know if I believe the story either, but I, I, I would be interested in it. And I think that if it is true, the one thing that, that Marvel is going to be looking at is the success of Deadpool. Because right. Deadpool is the rated R film. It's a comic book movie. How does it do financially? Um, and then if, if Fox goes and makes a successful rated R comic book movie, then Marvel can come out swinging with Blade if they wanted to. Because right. Blade, for I think, doesn't get enough credit. Because, yes, X-Men started a big craze with superheroes. But Blade kind of was there first, yeah. you know, in, the, in like 98 or 99, 99. whenever it came out. Um, so I'd like to see it. I, I think it could fit into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I, going off of Schnepp's point with, the, with Netflix is that depending on how they introduce it, it, it could be in that gritty world of uh, of dead i mean of uh daredevil i mean daredevil has set it up in a way that i would if you set up enough seasons i wouldn't it wouldn't be so far-fetched to me if blade lived in that universe and i mean look we have aliens we have all these different things guardians existed in the marvel cinematic universe so 
if vampires existed, sure. Why not? And if it, as long as it's not done cheesy and they find a way to do it. But I'm wondering, though, if because it's so different, the Blade universe, yeah. that you could say, if they wanted to, that those, those movies did fit into the Marvel Cinematic Universe because there's nothing to really retcon anything in there. Right. No, there's not. And you know what's interesting, too, is that if you watch Expendables 3, and I'm not sure why you would, but... <laughs> and, and Mel that, Gibson, that's why. That new series, The Player... That um, that Wesley Snipes is in. If you look at the promo set, I gotta say, Snipes is looking good. I mean, he physically he looks good. He looks like he could step back in. I mean, he doesn't look as formidable as he used to, but very few people have. So, I mean, it, it raises some interesting possibilities. All right, what's next? 20th Century Fox has announced that Breaking Bad star Brian Cranston has signed on to the upcoming comedy Why Him alongside James Franco. Why Him takes place over the holidays as a Midwestern dad, played by Brian Cranston, travels with his family to visit his daughter at college and soon finds himself in a bitter rivalry for her affections with her new brash tech billionaire boyfriend, played by James Franco. Christian, what do you think of the sounds of Why Him and could a Cranston-Franco comedy duo work? I think it sounds like perfect casting. And I do think that it could work. Um, Brian Cranston has amazing comedy chops. And not only with Malcolm in the Middle, stuff he did on Breaking Bad, like the, the pizza box, the, the grabbing his crotch and saying this, I, he, he's a funny dude. He, any interviews, he's a funny guy. James Franco has proven he can do comedy. Um, this premise could be a disaster. This premise could be really funny. I don't know, did they announce who the team is behind it, who's directing it, who's writing it? Do we know that yet? Um, I believe they announced a director, but I can't remember who okay. it was off the top of my head. Because that's obviously that that plays dividends as far right. as how it's going to be and and if they've worked together. But I think it could be interesting, and I want to see Brian Cranston. He hasn't really stepped in anything big after Breaking Bad. I thought Godzilla was going to be that, and then if you've seen Godzilla, he wasn't really given right. an opportunity to do that. So he had, and I, Daniel, he was rumored for Lex Luthor for a while. I thought that was going to happen. That didn't happen. So this isn't necessarily the one that's going to turn him into a mega superstar uh, movie star, but I'd like to see him use those comedy chops, and I think Franco could be fun. There are two interesting films coming out with him in it, though, that could be that for him. Number one is Trumbo. We've been talking about Trumbo right. with Brian right. Cassidy. That, that, this this kind of smells a little bit like an Academy type of film. So I'm really curious to see Trombo, what you, you mean. Trombo, right, thank you. Right. What did I say? I thought you meant, I, no, I thought you meant, I thought you meant oh, that. Oh, yeah, Trombo. no, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so that one looks good. He also just finished shooting a film with James Franco that James Franco also directed mm -hmm. called In Dubious Battle. And I believe it's based on a true story, like in the 1920s, of an effort for California fruit pickers to unionize. And it's got James Franco, it's got Ed Harris, it's got Robert Duvall, it's got Selena Gomez, it's got a whole bunch of things. So obviously Brian and James just finished working together. Apparently they must have yeah. liked working together. I can't help but think that this sounds like a modern era father of the bride, a yeah. little bit. Like that's and with you know with uh, Brian Cranston kind of taking on the Steve Martin role a little bit. Sounds a bit like that. Sounds like it could be really cool. I'm not jumping up and down about it, but it sounds like it could be ent entertaining. I'm kind of curious about it. Schnapp, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it sounds interesting. In fact, in Dubious Battle sounds way more interesting to me. Uh, this just sounds like a strange '80s rehash. Talented people, though both those guys are really talented. But I'm with Christian, like. Who's writing it? Who's directing it? Because this could be just trash DVD, or it could be like one of the funniest comedies right. I've seen all year. It, it depends on how they execute it. It's a, just those two sentences, like father comes to find out his daughter's dating a billionaire, you know, and you're like, eh, that's how I feel about it. I, I guess another key thing will be is who do they cast as the daughter? Because right. you get the right you get the right person in between Cranston and Franco, that could actually be Jennifer like, Lopez. No. <laughs> Jennifer Lopez. No, is that, is that bad? Perfect I'm, casting yeah, call. Yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's 21 laps in 20th Century Fox, and John Hamburg is directing. Sean oh. Levy and Ben Stiller are producing. All right, so that gives us a little bit of a flavor for where it's going to be coming from, too. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for Buy or Sell. Here's that, Here's how this works. In front of her, Sinead's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down, and those at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Sinead, what do we got? According to a story in The Hollywood Reporter, 20th Century Fox has picked up the rights to the illustrated novel Fall of Gods and is developing it for a feature film release with the Maze Runner director, Wes Ball, on board to helm the project. The Fall of Gods is described as follows. He, the gods have long ago <coughs> vanished. In their place, two rivaling races now inhabit Midgard, humans and Jotnar. Fifteen years ago, a coalition of chieftains drove the Jotnar race from Midgard. Now, from each side of the border, humans and Jotnar each 
eye each other with hatred and suspicion. When his wife, the estranged daughter of one of the Midgard's most powerful chieftains, is mysteriously kidnapped, a retired warrior takes up the hatchet and sets out to rescue her. But he risks unleashing the wild demon buried deep within him and losing his soul in the process. His journey will bring him into conflict with terrible forces as the cynical plot is revealed and the Darth and the dark mythological past of the North begins to awaken once more. John, do you buy or sell the sounds of Fall of Gods? I buy it. This is a really interesting sounding proposal. And you know what? Maze Runner is one of those films that to me on the surface just look like trash. I mean, it looked like another city of bones to me at first. And it's actually not a bad little film and I'm I'm kind of looking forward to um well, whatever whatever it is. Scorch Trials. Scorch Trials. You'll never last a day in the scorch. They should just call it Littlefinger and be <laughs> off with it. But anyway, what's really interesting though is this Wes Ball dude, he's like 29 years old. This is a kid. And he's already got these two major motion pictures on his belt. He's got this one coming. Honestly, this sounds like a really cool play, depending on the style, depending on the budget, what they do with it. But on its surface, it sounds great to me. I'm going to give it a buy, Schnepp. Yeah, I'm going to buy it to you, looking at just at the pre-production art or those designs that you know you see associated with it. You just do a search for Fall of the Gods. It looks like epic. I mean, I think they should get Amana Marth to do the musical scores. Black metal, <laughs> what's up? And um, yeah, I buy it. I can't wait to see this movie. Christian? I absolutely buy it. I, I I still have bad taste in my mouth from uh, the Immortals and Clash of the Titans and Wrath of the Titans. Right. I know this goes away from the, so a little bit of that mythology, but it's in the same vein. And I love that type of stuff. This sounds really intriguing. And I agree. The director, like, I didn't... I. After seeing movies like uh, Beautiful Creatures and and then, I don't know, the other one with little, there's, there's a bunch of these garbage young adult ones that I thought Maze Runner was going to be another one. And I didn't necessarily love the movie, but I thought the director did a really good job with what could have yeah, been he did. garbage. Um, but this sounds really cool. It sounds intriguing. I love the idea of this of this warrior. It's almost like Perseus who's who's going out there, has to, has to go and rescue... Um, Whoever it is with the, the fact that he doesn't want to wake up this demon and has to fight for his soul. There, like you said, Schnepp, it sounds like it's calling for a nice big epic movie and one that we haven't, that we're not really that familiar with. I mean, granted, yeah. it's a book, but we don't know. It's 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 fairly it's original. It's it's one of these movies that you're like, oh wait, this isn't just a property that's been done a thousand times. It's a brand new take on uh, this mythology. Plus, all the all the ones you mentioned are all Greek mythology, and this right. is Norse mythology. Right. So right. it's a little it's a little different and more interesting to me just because that hasn't been played out yet. Like Clash the Titans, Wrath the Titans, and yeah, so that's all like you know. Yeah. Greek mythology. And I believe right, there right. is a rule right now in, in the, the guidelines that say if you're doing a movie on Norse mythology, uh, you have to have death metal. I, I believe that's that's in that there. Has to the it just death should metal be. has to be there. You know, yeah. we were saying before, we were talking about it before the show started. It's like none of us have actually read Fall of Gods. If any of you guys have read Fall of Gods, please let us know in the comments section. Let us know what you think of the graphic novel itself, or as they're calling it, the illustrated novel itself, and let us know what you think of the, uh, how it's going to do or how it could play out as a movie. We'd love to hear thoughts. All right, what's next? According to a report in Deadline, Blue is the warmest color and Spectre star Leah Sadu has been offered the female lead role of Bella Donna Boudreaux in the upcoming Fox film Gambit, starring Channing Tatum. Rise of the Planet of the Apes director Rupert Wyatt, Rupert Wyatt is helming the film, which is set for an October 2016 release. Schnapp, do you buy or sell the addition of Leah Sadu to Gambit? Yeah, I'm going to buy it. I mean, she seems very young to be playing against uh, Channing, Channing Tatum. Tatum. But she's also, I mean, everything I've heard, I've, I didn't see uh, Blue is the Warmest Color yet, but I've heard she's amazing in it, so I buy it. Look, one of the key things that an actor needs to do, when often when you see performances you hear people raving about, this is what the actors do. They are able to emotionally emote on screen in such a way that it makes you, it draws you into the film and makes you believe that their emotions are real. That's a rare thing when actors can do that and do it very well. In Blue is, I, I don't know, how many better examples of that that I've seen than in Blue is the Warmest, warmest Color? You believe her in that. Like the emo every emotion from the excitement and anticipation and fear and trepidation and, and love and passion and all that kind of stuff, she sells you on that movie completely. I, I'm all on board with her, and that's why I was excited when I found out she was going to be Inspector. Mm. So to see her play a role like this, this is a different kind of role, man. The action, comic book, whatever. You're right, she feels kind of young, although I don't know her actual age, but to see her play off Channing Tatum, where, I mean, look, he passes, as a cop, he passes himself off in high school, so whatever. Maybe <laughs> maybe it won't look so weird right. on screen, but I'm excited about the casting. A lot of people don't know her name, but you will know her name, because she's really quite 
that good. Anyway, so for me, it's a buy. I think everyone's going to buy it, and I'm buying it too, especially after Bond comes out. I think she's going to have a big enough role in that to where because Blue, Blue is the Warmest Color isn't a movie that a lot of people have seen. It's it, The casting directors obviously saw it, and they cast her <laughs> in the movie, but a lot of people haven't seen that movie because it was so small. Bond, on the other hand, most right. people will see that movie, and then yeah. everybody that's watching this right now is going, well, I don't really, I'm not familiar with her. Rewind to this episode after you see Bond going, yeah. bye! And I, and I haven't seen the movie, but I'm guessing, because I think that the same people, what the Bond movies have done really well, not even just casting strong females, casting in general, putting her in there, and I think this is a good move as well, too. So I'm hoping that she, it hits my expectations of how she doesn't bond, and I, I absolutely buy her to adding talent. It's what we talk about all the time now on this show is what all these movies are doing, and I'm glad this new wave of what comic book movies and Star Wars movies and all these movies are doing, they're going after premier acting talent, not just movie stars. Yeah, that's that's the key, right? The, a lot of these things now, first, we had this evolution where comic book movies would come out and you never got the big stars. And then all of a sudden, a couple of big stars sh signed on and now you just expect big stars. But like you were pointing out, now there's this next stage where they're not just going after big stars, they're going after big talent yeah. they're going after people it doesn't matter if people have heard of these people right. before these people are uber talented let's get them in the movie that bodes nothing but well for the future of the genre it's a really good move all right what's next perhaps we can start calling it dennis don't uh move the camera yet okay i'm gonna take this again <clears throat> <laughs> perhaps we can start calling it straight out of skull island oh nice. yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Wait, wait what was it oh yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> It was so tough. Enter until John then. Cambia breakdancing in his Adidas windbreaker. <laughs> all right. Uh, Slow I think I just earned myself raised, by the way. According to one. a report in Variety, straight out of Compton's Jason Mitchell, who played Easy E in the film, is in talks to join the cast of Kong Skull Island. Mitchell would be joining his Compton co star, Corey Hawkins, who played Dr. Dre. Already on the cast are Toby Kebble, Tom Hiddleston, Samuel L. Jackson, John C. Riley, and Brie, Lars Brie Larson. Excuse me. Christian, would you buy or sell the edition of Jason? And Mitchell to the cast of Kong Skull Island. Well, allow me to repeat myself as I buy this. Um, <laughs> they are putting together talent. That he was one of the standouts in that movie. He was amazing as Easy E. You believed he was Easy E. Um, but this cast so far, even though we were all kind of not, I wouldn't say up in arms, but we were upset when Michael Keaton disappointed. And J.K. Simmons. Yeah, and J.K. Yeah. Simmons left. And like, oh no! And then like two days later, they announced. Um, who, it was Tom Hiddleston. Tony Kebble, uh, Tom Dave, Hiddleston was already on board. Sam Jackson. Yeah. Sam, I mean, they announced all these people. So they're they're doing the same thing of what we were just talking about. Now, Sam Jackson, phenomenal actor, but is one of those guys that is it, it will you can find him in anything. Yeah. As where you then you'll take other um, Brie Larson, Brie Larson yeah. who now is popping up in bigger movies, but she's still that. She's an she's a really great actor. Yeah, she is. So yeah, this kid in there, I think this is a great cast, and I'm very curious. We still don't. All we know is that Skull Island and King Kong is going to be there, but what's it about? We don't know that yet. Yeah, I for me, it's also it's a buy across the board today for me. I I buy this. If the Academy Awards were being held tomorrow, and they are not, a lot of big Oscar contending films are still yet to come out this year, but if the Academy Awards were being held tomorrow, I don't know how you don't nominate Jason Mitchell for right. Best Actor. Uh, I, I don't know that he wins, but I don't know how you don't nominate him. He just made me believe the movie. I think there's a reason why he was the first guy we really saw in the movie, mm -hmm. is because he brought us into it. The moment he came on screen and started acting, I was in that world for NWA. I just loved the way he handled himself, and it carried its way all the way through. Even in the third act, when I thought they lost their way a little bit personally, he was still a North Star sure. for me in that movie, who always brought it back to where the folks needed to be. I was really impressed by him. Bring him in a movie like... Now, it's, it's hard to say fit because like you said we don't know really what this movie is really going right. to be about what's the main theme or whatever so we can't comment to fit yet but on paper adding him to a movie like this great move it's a buy yeah i'm unfortunately gonna have to sell not just kidding <laughs> totally buying this yeah i think he's a great fit too i loved him in straight out of compton i love the idea of of kong skull island i don't mind the kong you know floating above skull island I'm just interested. I, I want to see how they're going to differentiate this from Jurassic Park. Obviously, they're not making dinosaurs. Those dinosaurs are already there. Right. So, but it sounds like it's anytime we get an adventure like this, this reminds me of like a 60s or a 70s movie that they just stopped making. And now we're going to jump right into 2015 with our technology that we could do now and make an adventure film like that. So I think the cast is great so far. And adding this guy is, is great because he's a really good actor. Well, you know what makes me nervous, though, is that 
I don't think anybody's disputing how many great actors are already cast in this. <clears throat> what makes me nervous is why do you need so many? And it and after I see the movie, I'm like, well, that's exactly why they needed so many. But we're at Skull Island. It's a prequel to Kong, um, so we don't we know that we assume nobody makes it off the island because is it a prequel to Kong? That's what I, I mean. Otherwise, he's I mean he's, I he's don't dead. Believe it. Uh, they've they said dead. they've said that it's uh, indeterminate on what time period it takes place. But, yeah, it could but be he's seventies modern day. But I, he's but he's dead. But I don't know that this is a sequel to right. Kong. Hey, right. Well, it's, then it's a prequel. This or, no, this is also could be, could be a complete reimagining Just, of the whole. Oh, so, so like as if it never happened. Yes. Yeah. Or, we or, don't know. That's okay. the answer. We, we or don't it know. could I, be like like Son of Kong. Remember, there's another Kong. Yeah, a bunch I'm, of Kongs. I'm all right with that. But I, but I <laughs> many but, Kongs. Yeah, many, that's the name of it. Many yeah. Kongs. Did um, Jamie Kennedy star in Son of Kong. Please there, don't have Jamie yeah. Kennedy. Star in <laughs> no, but I just so I'm just curious. I'm curious because I thought for some reason it was a prequel. But even so, even if it is a retelling, I want because with Peter Jackson's King Kong which I actually do enjoy the film. I just thought it was about an hour too long. Um, but Dude, I've always said, if they just cut off the first hour and started the movie with, when they're in the boat approaching the island, that's it. It's 50% a great, yeah, better movie. Absolutely, but one of the things that I had problems with was there, was there were so many characters that you really didn't need that many. It was just basically like, oh, we need some people to die. So we're going to pick right. them off. And I hope it doesn't turn into that. Like, oh, we just need so many actors and we just want them all to die one by one. I was going to say King Kong, Peter Jackson, King Kong, it would have been better if they cut it into three different movies and kind of stretched it all out. Just Nobody kidding. would have gone to see the first movie, though. I'm joking. I'm trying to do a so. Hobbit joke. <laughs> <laughs> I fell flat. Sorry, guys. All right, folks. Hey, listen. <laughs> it's Wednesday, which means it's that time of the week for us to go into rewind mode, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Every week on Wednesdays, we like to look back. I call it the feeling old segment, where we look back at the movies that opened 10 years ago this week and the movies that opened 20 years ago this week. Now, last week, Rewind was really a kick because we had two major, major ones. We had Mortal Kombat and we had The 40-Year-Old Virgin. Mm -hmm. This week, even better films. No, they're not. I'm lying to you. <laughs> this was not a great week to go to the movies. 10 years ago, this week, opening in theaters, Brothers Grimm uh, with Matt Damon and Heath Ledger. We had that little horror film, The Cave, by little, I mean entertainment value is very little. And we had Undiscovered. Opening 20 years ago today, we had, of course, who can forget the amazing panda adventure. We all already forgot it. We had Beyond Ragoon, which I don't think any of us at this table ever saw it. We had The Lord of Illusion, which actually I remember it was a little bit of a guilty pleasure of mine at the time. And we had, I, I think the best movie on this list is actually Desperado. Um, so yeah. anyway, Christian, you look at these seven films, ones that opened 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Which ones of these films stand out to you? Well, what stands out to me after looking at this is that a lot of people weren't going to the movies to see a lot of these movies. Not this weekend. And I was one of them. <laughs> I've seen one of these movies. And that, that would be, oops, there we go. I would see, I saw Desperado. And I loved Desperado when I saw it. There was a lot of fun. I thought it was still one of Rodriguez's best. It was a. It is absolutely. It, it was. It, it's. It was like a retelling of El Mariachi, yes. and so I, I. And I had seen El Mariachi. I remember seeing it in in school, and I, and I was always really excited to to see what they do with the, what he could do with a little more money and with right. Banderas because Banderas was taking over the role. Um, and it was just it was so outrageous. It was so bizarre. It it had it, it really introduced me a little bit more to Rodriguez and made me a huge fan of his back then. I just wish he would have done more since then. But that's the one to me uh, that I really, that, that I've ever seen. I know that I avoided Cave. I wanted to see Brothers Grimm. And I think I've seen about five minutes of it. And <laughs> no, that was it. Not. I saw about five minutes recently <laughs> and I built. Yeah, you don't want to see Brothers yeah, Grimm. Yeah. That's, uh, Brothers Grimm stands out to me as like the start of the decline of Terry Gilliam's yeah. uh, you know, powerful directing abilities. I mean, Brothers Grimm is all over the place. Lena Headey's in it. Everyone, everyone was trying to do a good movie, but it just falls apart. Uh, my favorite film on here, I love Desperado. That's a really fun action film. I love all the mariachis with their crazy guns and guitar stuff. It's a great Robert Rodriguez film. I love Lord of Illusions. That film, to me, has is it's grown on me over the years. It's Clive, it was one of Clive Barker's. He directed it. It's a freaky, weird, magic, supernatural horror film. It's got really amazing, horrific scenes in it. It's very memorable. There's a lot of incredible special effects. So Lord of Illusions really sticks out to me as a, one of the better ones. Didn't see, uh, whenever I, I hear Beyond Rangoon, I think Crab Rangoon. That's just me. <laughs> uh, amazing Pan Adventure, totally didn't see it. Why not? The, uh, I was too busy with all the other panda movies I was <laughs> trying to see. Um, 
<laughs> what was the other one? Brothers Grimm and uh, Cave and something else? Yeah, doesn't the Cave and something. Yeah, I mean, yeah, for me, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, Desperado was such a cool film, and and you know, he, the director, he was actually really at the height of his powers at that time, and we we kind of been waiting for him to get back yeah. to that a little bit. What what kills me though is it is the quintess in my personal head. It's not really, but in my personal head, it is the quintessential Antonio Banderas as well. Um, is an and here's the thing. It reminds me whenever I see the poster. I do not know why I have this association. It reminds me of this one time that Antonio Banderas was hosting Saturday Night Live. I don't know if you ever saw this, but he would play. I think he was playing himself, if I'm not mistaken. I could be, maybe it was another actor playing him. But I think he was playing himself. And Horatio Sanchez would be like his. Uh, what do you call it? His hype man that would be around with, always walking just behind Antonio. And when Antonio would be on a date, Antonio would talk to a girl, talking as suave as Antonio does. I just remember this is one of my favorite sound I just gets in and goes, The temperature in the room is very warm. I must undo one button. And he starts to reach for a shirt, and Horatio Sanchez would be going, No, Antonio, no, too sexy, too sexy. And then he would do one, and Horatio would like lose his mind. Like, ah, it was just a great thing. Brothers Grimm is one of the most disappointing trips I ever took to the theater because I was so excited, not just because it had Heath Ledger and Matt Damon, but it had Monica Belushi. I, I think you're thinking of Monica Belushi, not Lena Headley. But no, had, she's in it as well. Is she as yep. well? She's not the main witch, though. That no. was um, Okay, I didn't know she was in that. See, I already forgot that. But Monica Belushi was in it, who I, to this day, have an uncompromising crush on Monica Belushi. And it's so bad. It's so bad. Not only was it just a bad film in general, this is one of those things where it just felt like everybody mailed it in. Heath Ledger was awful in this really? film. Yeah, Matt yeah. Damon was awful in this film. Monica Belushi had nothing to do. It And it was, you're right, it was all over the place, and it was just, you could tell that at the base of it, there must have, there might have been a seed of a genius idea for it. Mm -hmm. But it was too genius because you couldn't make it There's manifest. There's a bunch of weird, quirky ideas that never manifested. Yeah. There's just a lot of weird starts and stops. It's a disappointing mm -hmm. film. It was a really disappointing <laughs> film. Capping off, at the time, a disappointing weekend. All right, folks. Hey, listen, before we get to mailbag, I want to let you know about a little contest going on, a little giveaway going on. I shouldn't say little. It's a big one over at Collider. Dot com. Now, in the description of this video, you will find a link to the page on Collider.com giving you all the details. But we are giving away, what are we giving away? We're giving away video games, we're giving away a PlayStation, we're giving away tons of stuff. And here's, it's the simplest way to enter the competition as well to see if you can win one of these great things. All you gotta do is be a follower on our Collider Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, or be a subscriber to our YouTube channel right here. Just doing one of those things enters you in the contest. Once again, check the link in the video description below. They'll take you to the page. It'll give you all the details, list out all the prizes. Go and check that out and make sure you might be eligible to win. All right, with that out of the way, it is time for Mailbag. Listen, folks, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime to collidervideo at gmail.com. We try to take a couple questions every day. So, Sinead, what's in the mailbag? Sean writes, hi, guys. Why isn't James Spader in more things? This guy is a god. Just <laughs> watching him in The Blacklist gives me goosebumps. He is an unbelievable actor, and him as Ultron was the most perfect decision anyone has ever made. He should be in every <laughs> film, yet he isn't. Why is that? As he clearly has amazing talent. I remember a few months ago, I had the, I, I don't cover a lot of junkets anymore because I'm not just not into junkets, but Age of Ultron, I wanted to go and cover that one. So I did. And I remember my my favorite memory of that one, besides my interview with Chris Evans and Chris Hemsworth, which is if you saw it, you know, why I'll always remember that one. But it was Scott, I got to sit down with James Spader and I'm a big fan of the TV show, The Blacklist. This guy's voice is one of the best voices in the business right now because we're sitting down and first of all, he's every bit as classy as you imagine he is. He's wearing this dynamite suit when I went in and sat down with him and he's so composed and he starts talking about his daughter playing Nintendo, right? And even though he's just talking about his kid playing a video game system, it felt like he was talking about international espionage. Mm -hmm. You know, my daughter. I'm not even going to try to do his voice, but his voice is so freaking good in the way he carries himself and conducts himself. He's great. He actually did this really cool film that stuck with me. I watched it when I was a kid. 
I thought it was so cool when I was a kid just because there were boobies in it. But honestly, as I revisit the film, it's actually a great film. Remember that film, Crash? Oh, I it love did, Crash. Not the Crash, the one that won Best Picture at the Academy Awards. It's a David Cronenberg's Crash. Yes. And he, like that film he was in, he was great. That one he did with Maggie Gyllenha Jell Hall, the secretary. Oh, yes, yeah, secretary. Yeah. Also Fantastic. Also had boobies, but when you watch the film, it's just a brilliant, brilliant film. But you got to remember a couple things. Number one, James Spader's a little bit busy these days. He's got this hit show called The Blacklist, which you can, you know, that's him playing one of my favorite characters on TV right now in, in Red. Uh, so he's got that going on. Secondly, it's like the Brian Cranston situation. I remember when Breaking Bad was ending, I was had these debates with friends of mine, and they say, oh, Brian Cranston's about to be a big major star. He's going to be an A-list star across the board. And it's like, no, he's, he's a great actor, but there's not a lot of leading roles out right now that are going to call for, for his type of an actor. There's just not. James Spader's the same thing. He's not going to headline the latest romantic comedy. You know, he's, he's not going to be the lead in Gambit. So the amount of roles that are going to be available to, to him are unfortunate, uh, unfortunately a little bit limited, but you can bet that when he is in those films, he's going to knock it out of the park. But I think for the most part right now, it's just a matter of he's, he's got a family. He's real busy with this TV show that is a big hit right now. TV shows are on for a limited amount of time, so he's riding that for as much as he can right now. So I think that's why you probably don't see him in a lot more stuff on screen than we do. And Christian, how do you interpret it? I agree with you. And it's just that voice, strings. Like everything about, like everything <laughs> you, he does. You do a much better James Spader than me. <laughs> but he does. He just has that, he's got that smoothness to him. And, and when you guys mentioned Secretary, by the way, what you should have said is the real movie version of Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah, right. yeah um, true. And he he's just elevates, he's one of those guys. I'd like to see him have a career somewhat to what, the, like the resurgence of uh, Michael Keaton or mm. J.K. Simmons, like doing roles like that. But you're absolutely right like especially on an on a network show those are a lot of episodes man that's a lot of time so when he goes and does something like ultron it, it's smart it's like it's a big huge marvel movie it's gonna it's probably a nice paycheck he's gonna he's gonna you know be in it's gonna get his face out there more it's gonna make more people watch his television show so he's got to be able to pick and choose at this point because he's going to be so busy on that show. I think that you will because this show is such a hit that maybe in the downtime, maybe you'll maybe he that's when he shot Ultron was during the downtime of Blacklist. He'll probably pop up in something else. But I agree with you, by the way. Um, I forget the kid's name who wrote the email, but I Sean Sean. I agree with Sean. I want to see him more because he is one of those guys. Like even like uh, the great oh my god, my, Michael Caine uh, pops up. In, Older, obviously, but pops right. up in so much stuff, a lot, all the time. Even he was just in Kingsman. I want to see Spader do stuff like that. I, that those are the types of roles. He's not going to carry a movie, right, but he right. can elevate anything that he's in. Well, I think he's been he's been in so many movies, starting with Sex Lies and Videotape. You know, that was like Soderbergh's right. first film. Right. That's his big film. And then he was in a lot of other films, including Crash. I mean, he, it's not like he ever disappeared off the map and then he got, you know, he's out of somebody dusted him off to be Ultron. <laughs> he's always been around. It's just now more people know about him because of Ultron. That's really the re it's the reverse. It's right. like it's like he was he's never was in a giant hit movie. He would take and pick selectively really kind of like off the wall and kind of strange films. And he's a great actor. He's a great character actor. So I think him taking on the blacklist and doing Ultron only means we'll get more people getting a, an awareness of him saying he's underrated, meaning he's going to get more roles. So I think we'll see him popping up in great character roles for a long time. And coming. television has been very, very good to James Spader. I, I honestly think my favorite James Spader stuff out of all those movies, whatever. First of all, he's won three a Best Actor uh, Primetime Emmy Awards, all for playing the, the same character over two different shows. Mm -hmm. uh, he played this one character, this lawyer in The Practice, and then that character got his own spinoff show, Boston Legal, that he did with the great William Shatner, who, and then William Shatner won a bunch of Emmys for that as well. And I remember that show, Boston Legal, that one of my favorite, my favorite part of that show, they ended the show almost every episode the same way out on the balcony, if you will, of this high rise, powerful office building, two chairs and a bottle of bourbon. And the show would always end with William Shatner and James Spader sitting at night on those chairs overlooking the city over a bottle of bourbon and then having the scene between the two of them that would last anywhere between five and 10 minutes. And those were always the most fascinating. That's the key of a great performer, man. Just put them in a chair talking to another great performer and you're glued to the screen. And when they did that, I was always glued to it. Spader's got a great history with television, especially in the last 10, 15 years. He's very comfortable with television. Like you were pointing out, this is network. This ain't like 
HBO or Dexter or like Game of Thrones where I get to go. I got ten episodes right. to shoot. You got twenty two episodes. Right. You and not like Netflix scene. where they shoot it. They shoot it all with one one shot, like a one big long movie, and then you're done. This is like weeks and weeks. Yeah. And weeks. So he's busy. He's and he's totally successful right now. When he wants to do more movies, they won't be the big leading roles, unfortunately, except for, unless it's a good political one or whatever. But like Michael Caine, that's a great illustration for a career path he can well, do. Well, I also want to make sure that we address the commenters who are going crazy right now. Yes, we are very aware that he did Stargate. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're hyper aware of that. We're yeah. not, so that's the one that everyone knows. Right. Yeah. All right, what's next? Aaron writes, greetings, Collider crew. I know all of you see tons of movies each year, good and bad. My question is, has a movie ever been so bad that you have literally gotten <laughs> up out of your seat and walked out before the film was over? One of my favorite stories of this is one I just became aware of. It involves you and Mark Ellis. Are you Sex in the City too? No, no, oh, no. Okay. Um, uh, what was it? Uh, the, <laughs> was the one that they just did with... Um, uh, she's the cop. She oh, God. Uh, pursu uh, pursuit. Hot pursuit. Hot pursuit. Oh, you guys are talking about Spicy Larry. <laughs> Hot, Hot pursuit. pursuit. Right, where right. I guess Christian and Mark were sitting. Mark was telling me the story the other day. Christian and Mark were sitting down, and about, I don't know if it was halfway through the movie, Mark started to get up, and he turns to Christian and goes, Hey, um, I'm going to go to the bathroom, and I'm not coming back. You wish he said it that nice. <laughs> <laughs> that nice? Um, I have only, honestly, I, I love movies so much, and I have such a huge respect for filmmakers and whatever. That is very, very rare in my life that I get up and walk out of a movie. But it has happened to me three times. Uh, I think the first time it ever happened to me was that Jennifer Connelly horror film, Dark Water. Ooh, gross. Um, that it was just, and I love Jennifer Connelly. And it had the guy in it from Usual Suspects who played Kaiser Soze's lawyer. Uh, and I, I oh, can't, right, right, right. But he, and, and he passed away a few years ago. Kobayashi. Very sadly. Yes, yeah, uh, Kobayashi. Yeah. Um, Dark White was just so bad. I, I made it about three quarters of the way through that movie and I left. The second one I walked out of was Johnny Knoxville's uh, comedy about the Special Olympics, The Ringer. Mm. That's what the name of it. Now, I understood they had the best of intentions. They had the best of intentions. They meant no offense. They didn't. They, they had all the best motives of making that. But walking The Ringer, even though I know it wasn't what they were intending to do, that movie just so blatantly felt to me like they were making fun of handicapped people, not fun with handicapped people. And that's what they were going for, is to make fun with them, to elevate them. That's what he was going for, and I get that. So I had no anger towards Johnny Knoxville, but it, I felt like they failed so badly and it was just coming across as making fun of handicapped people that I felt totally uncomfortable with. And about 40 minutes in the movie, I had to get up and walk out. The last one I walked out of, me and Soul Video, we went to see movie 47 and i don't know why i went to go see because i knew it looked bad but johnny he convinced me let, let's just go see it and we walked in 43 or 40, 40, was it 43 or 40, i don't know now i thought it was 43 yeah you're right 47 is agent 47 yeah so the movie, important yeah, thing here is that it doesn't matter what it's called but right. we'll say it was 43 <laughs> yeah. movie 43 the, our first warning was that we walked in on its opening weekend we were the only two in the theater and we started watching it and it believe started with that hugh jackman skit where he had testicles on his yeah. neck and then it went to a bad, the bad Batman one. And it was like, I think I lasted less than 20 minutes. Mm. And I'm like, dude, I got to split. I can't watch this anymore. My life on my, the clock of my life is ticking away and I cannot spend it here. Yeah. So I got up. So those are the three for me, Dark Water, The Ringer, and movie 43 are the ones I've ever walked out. Have you ever walked out of a film? Yes. And um, it's funny you bring up the Mark Ellis thing for the Hot Pursuit, but there's another one, and I mentioned it when you brought that up, was Sex in the City 2 is one of my favorite stories of all time where we don't, one of our rules is no phones when we're in there. Phones don't go on, phones don't, they, they're off. I don't like to be that guy blasting phones and disturbing people in the theater. So this is before we were going to press screenings and stuff, and we had seen Sex in the City 2, we we're going to review it. You know, because I like to review everything. So we're, we're, we're watching it, and it was just, like, so bad. If you, our review of it, we lost it because everything was like a Fozzie the Bear joke after a while. Like, waka, waka, waka. You know, it was so bad. And then they go to Dubai, and this camera's like, Mark just disappears. And I'm like, okay, he's going to the bathroom or whatever, too. And he's gone. I'm like, where did he go? And I was like, I, I, all right, I'll check my phone. I don't want to do it. Check it. And it, it, it's like a spy text. It's like, get out of there, man. Get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> With exclamation points. And I'm like, and I didn't know why, but I just got up and ran and left out of the theater. I just couldn't take it. I felt like somebody was just punching me in the face like for no reason. Um, and then the other one was when I was like, 11 or something i went at uh 12 i saw some movies with uh, 
my friends, we picked one movie at the Dollar Theater and saw Bushwhacked with Daniel Stern. Oh and my when, gosh. When you make when when you walk a bunch of eleven and twelve year olds, you're and and you're going for that really immature humor, you are bombing because that that should have been a movie we're all laughing our asses off right. but we, we didn't it was terrible so um i think those are the only ones i can really think of i can if I answer from mark mark walked out of the first uh, gi joe movie he was that really? oh yeah oh and the other one the other one that we both walked out of actually was uh oh man it was, oh, what was the name of that movie shoot i can uh, I'll, I'll, let me think about it and then I'll, I'll get back to you i remember what it was though you know, have you ever walked out of anything surprisingly only a few um to come to mind i've sat through ones that i I, uh, that you wish you walked out. Yeah, of? <laughs> Sucker Punch was the one that is the most recent one where I actually went sat through all of it, but wanted to leave about one third of the way through, then halfway through, and then even like like at the seventy minute mark, I was like, <sighs> you know, I was like, this is such a horrible film, but I do want to see that third or I think it was the fourth dream within a dream within a dream. Right. So, you know, like those were great, those little things, and I was always felt like oh, if some nerd like would just cut those together, I could watch that on YouTube and feel happy about those 20 minutes. But the rest of the film was just just really hard to sit through. But I, I didn't walk out on that. The The film that I walked out on this year, I mean, I, I normally don't walk out on them. If I, I like I sat through City of Bones and mm -hmm. luckily it was one of those situations where it was just me and my friend and we had the whole theater. So we were just cracking jokes and <laughs> laughing. I Frankenstein, I enjoyed its horribleness. You know, because right. once again, no one in the theater but me and six people were like t yelling at the screen. <laughs> that kind of makes it fun and makes it endurable. Um, I walked out on Let's Be Cops this mm. year uh, because the trailer looked so funny. It was great trailers. It and really I love those actors. <laughs> and the movie was so horrible <laughs> and treated the viewer so stupidly like, you're so dumb. It was insulting. And we left. Me and my uh, Holly, we left. Yeah. So it was like one uh, of those things. Year One was the movie. Oh, the, the late great yeah. Harold Ramis. That one wasn't one yeah. of his best, but I remember. And again, Jack sitting, Black <laughs> sitting with Ellis, and we were. We, Ellis turns and to me, Michael he goes Sarah, like, right? he, "Yeah, Michael Sarah." And he goes, "Okay, if they make like a, 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 a what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas joke for wherever they were, we're leaving." And, and it happens with it. And then him saying that thirty seconds later, a Vegas joke comes. I'm like, wow! He just walked out. Yeah, it was great. So Nate, I'm curious. Like with all the movies you've gone to, have you ever actually either got up and walked out of a movie? And if you haven't, what's the one you came closest to getting up and walking out of? Um, well, the one that comes to mind, I'll never forget it either. Is I went to see Rachel getting married with Anne Hathaway right. on my 17th birthday, and. Um, I did like was like me and a few of friends and it just come out it was like the opening weekend of it or something like that. And the camera, I remember like the camera movement, they're trying to do that, like make it look like a low budget indie film. And I think it was an independent film, yeah. but it made me so nauseous that I got up like, like probably like six times because I thought it was going to throw up from the camera moving wow. until eventually I was like, screw this. I'm leaving. Like I can't. This is the worst birthday ever. <laughs> and I left. It's a pretty depressing movie. Too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what we were thinking. It's not a lift me up. I was going through a phase. I don't know. <laughs> All right, folks, that'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films are playing out our friends over at AMC Theaters. Head on over to www.amc theaters for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. Make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel. Become a subscriber here. If you want to get in on that little giveaway, make sure you're following us on Facebook. Just search for Collider on Facebook. You'll find us there. Follow us on Twitter and make sure, again, you're subscribed to this YouTube channel. And don't forget, we also have an Instagram account. Just look for us on Instagram at Collider Video. That's how you can find us there. Wendy's always putting up pictures of behind the scenes stuff here, so follow us on there. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me, sitting over here, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp and at TDOSLWH. You can find my movie, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, by going to the website, www.tdoslwh.com. You can get a digital download or a Blu-ray. Thanks. You know, I've had a lot of people asking me over the years, especially the last year or so, saying we should do MP3 commentary tracks for movies. And I've never really thought that'd be a fun idea. But now doing one with you for City of Bones sounds like it could be actually a lot of we fun. We should do those. Because <laughs> believe me, that would be a lot of fun. Yeah, those, get the whole crew together and just fun. like yeah. talking out loud, cracking get, out like, films. Get like all like seven yeah. of us sitting around uh, in a room. We have this mics in the room. If you would have had mics of us watching Supergirl, that would have been <laughs> interesting. Uh, yeah. Hey. Yeah. I liked it.
I was one of those. And hey, of I still like you. Mr. Christian Harloff. <laughs> Christian, where can people find you? You can find me at Christian Harloff on both Twitter and Instagram. And if you didn't know, if you didn't watch the show yesterday, we let you guys know that today is a very special episode of Collider Jedi Council. It's only on Wednesday today. It'll be back to Thursday next week. But we're taking a lot of Twitter questions today. Make sure you hashtag Collider Jedi Council. We're talking about everything that went down and some rumors and speculations. You know the deal if you watch the show. And, of course, our lovely host today, Ms. Sinead DeFree. Sinead, where can people find you? I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Sinead DeFree and at that's so Sinead.com. And you can simply follow me on Facebook or on Twitter, just at John Campia. Thanks a lot for joining us, guys. My name's John Campia for Collider Video, and until next time, bye-bye.